Good morning, Bible class. So glad that you came to school this morning. I feel confident that you've been studying the book of Acts all week. <laughs> well, this is the only class you probably weren't called to office in. <laughs> We'll not go into all that. <laughs> uh, we do welcome everybody here this morning. And as we gather around the Word of God and as we're studying the book of Acts and how it's relevant to, I don't know, it's, I say how the Bible's relevant to where we are today, uh, but it's more like we're relevant to to the Bible and, and how God wrote it because I'm not who's sure who's willing, being relevant to whom when it comes to uh, God's holy word. So we're going to start again in uh, chapter 7 today. This will be lesson 33 in chapter 7. And as we see and study about the early part of the book of Acts, the early days of the church and uh, what did the church look like? What does the scriptures say that the church looked like? And what is so interesting to me about God's holy word is you can have people that are you know, well learned, and I'm not against that by no means. Uh, I think I was scrubbing my beard there a little. But the Bible, the Holy Bible is a book that has been written to where a dairy farmer could understand it, to where a mechanic can understand it. Occasionally, few and far between, but occasionally even a doctor can understand it. <laughs> but God has written his word to the common man, all of us, can understand this word. I know a lot of times we approach it and, and I've heard people say, well, Alan, I just can't understand what I'm reading. And I, and I do get that. But what happens is that's the reason we have like these classes in here and we have teaching about the word of God. We're all to be taught. It's all, it's, it's, it's understandable that it's not understandable unless we be taught how it works and what God has going on. Uh, this church, for an instant, uh, as an example, is a church that's made up of a lot of different people from different backgrounds and different even denominations, if you will. In this room here with us today, we have some Methodists and a few Presbyterians scattered. We have Baptists, uh, one or two Catholics uh, come, uh, Anglican. Um, I don't, I'm just hollering out kind of what I remember, but in this church is representative, we're representatives of a lot of different denominations, if you will, and a denomination just means this is kind of your background of of who your teachers were. And at the end of the day, I promise you one promise, that what makes Christians Christians, or what's to make us Christian, is, is that we come together on the fundamentals of the faith, and the fundamentals of the faith, including Christ came to the earth as a sacrifice for the sin of all humanity, he lived a perfect life, died on a cruel cross, and the shedding of his blood is the atonement of all sin unto them that receive that good news. And so fundamentally we come together on those cardinal truths, and what I like about this church, we allow everybody to be just a little different. I, let, let, me, let, let me let you in on a secret. If everybody in here was a Methodist or a Baptist, you'd all say you believed the same thing, but none of you could get along. 
So, so there's, there's a lot of difference <laughs> within each denomination is my point. And even though New Life is not a denomination church, it's a non-denominational or it's an all-denominational, whatever what you want to call it, uh, it's made up of a lot of different uh, you know, backgrounds, let's say, of people. And uh, I'm personally from a Methodist first and then a Baptist denomination is my roots. And uh, so I'm thinking that uh, perhaps a new life is here beside the road to where if you're not really sure what you are, you can come. And uh, we're all trying to figure out where we're just of the, we're all in the body of Christ no matter what your denominational background is. And everybody's received here and accepted here in our differences, knowing that we're trying to study the Word of God and letting the Word of God be the plumb line that we're going to align ourselves with. Amen. And uh, it's just like uh, people say, y'all have heard me do a teaching on the third side. Who, how are you going to vote this time, Alan? I say, well, well with whoever aligns with the Word of God the most. That's, that's all. I'm not a Democrat, nor am I a Republican. I'm on the third side. I'm on, uh, I'm a, a, a Godlican, I guess. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things, I guess. But no, I'm on God's side. I'm on the Word of God's side. And uh, if any individual or party or whatever lines up, is it, are they going to line up perfectly with the Word of God? No. And neither do all the denominations. I hate to hurt some of you feeling, but no, we all got our flaws. And therefore lies the gospel. The gospel has been given to mankind because we're imperfect, which means we're not perfect beyond what a lot of people think they are in their own minds. We're just imperfect. So therefore, God's given us the gospel called His grace to be applied to our imperfections that we might be acceptable unto Him. Amen. So we're, this is a group of people that comes together in our imperfectness, understanding the person sitting beside us is imperfect, just as we are imperfect, but we're rejoicing because God's given a provision that he looks at us and says we're perfect in him. Amen. And it's in that we rejoice. But it's in that that holds this church together. We understand that we're all sinners here. There's no super saints but one. His name's Jesus. And we're all here the same. We're a given individual might be walking in the Spirit real good for a while. And then you might find your neighbor's not. Somebody might be walking in the Spirit and another one in sin today. And the, the question is, can you love each other just where you are? Because the grace of God covers us all. And aren't you glad? Aren't you just glad that's what brings us together? And it's a person and his name is Jesus. So this is what happened in the book of Acts. And we're bringing all of these people together. We are studying the, the place now, the context is Stephen. And he was stoned, as we all know. But Stephen turned into a preacher here in Acts chapter 7. And you had all these different people coming together. And as they were coming together, and he stood before the Sanhedrin, he gives them a Bible lesson. We started that Bible lesson last week. On him telling Israel, the Sanhedrin, giving them Bible stories. Now, here's what you got to understand. In all of these Bible stories, Stephen showing Israel how you failed to listen to God. That's what he was doing. He was giving them a history lesson. But the history lesson was how they always rejected God uh, the first time around. Second time around, they tended to do better. I mean, I mean, we all know that God gave them the promised land and it took them forever and a day to get there, right? It took 40 years around the mountain, but they had another 40 years before that that they rejected Moses as their leader, right? 
So, I mean, they just love to use the number 40 for some reason. They like to 40 it on out. And so, that in their disobedience, it tended to end up into a somehow of a 40-year journey if you watch Israel down through the ages. But Stephen's point was, God sends his messengers to you, and you continually reject them. That was his point. And read, I'm, as I get into the scripture, you'll see this is his point, that you don't un- to the Sanhedrin. God continually, historically, has sent his messengers, and you continue to reject them, including me. And he's talking, though, about you rejected Jesus. And so he just kind of told them the truth to their face. The Sanhedrin didn't like it because Peter and, and, and the disciples, they were calling in everybody. They're Jew, Gentile. They were letting people in the scum of the earth. And the reason is they had a message, and their message was that Jesus came to save sinners. When he was talking to the Sanhedrin, they thought they were perfect because of their performance. With that said, let's start here. Can somebody tell me who this person is? I'm sure his picture is hanging on your refrigerator door. (laughs) It sure is. George Whitfield. He said this, we must all have the spirit of martyrdom, though we may not all die martyrs. I thought that would be an uplifting little quote for this morning that y'all all would like. But we are talking about Stephen today. And Stephen got martyred, and, and I just thank the good Lord. I hope it's not required of me uh, to be a martyr physically, even though I feel like I'm being martyred internally. Anybody else? I'm having to die with all this stuff daily uh, that's within, inside, inside of me. So we're going to be martyred one way or the other. We just will give up a ghost and just get on with this dying part of our life. Here's something about George Whitfield. I'd like first to learn just a little bit, the side notes each week. George Whitfield was an English Anglican minister and preacher who was once the founder of Methodism and the evangelical movement. Born in Gloucester, he attended uh, Pembroke College in Oxford, 1732, born December 16th, 1714, in Gloucester, in United Kingdom, and he died uh, September the 30th, 1770, and he was just 55 years old. So he covered a lot of ground, did a lot of things for the kingdom of God in the short time that he was here on the earth. Now, let's move on here a little bit, and we're going to pick up here in the book of Acts. This is with Stephen before the council. A little quick, quick, quick review of this whole chapter. Uh, We see that Stephen's summary of the Old Testament is in Acts 7, 1 through 53. Now, that's a lot of verses in the Bible. In other words, that's a lot of prime real estate in this book. Okay, so we have to look at why in the world did the the Holy Spirit choose to spend this much time on Stephen giving a history lesson. And it's because of the magnitude of the point he was trying to make. His history lesson covers several characters in the Bible, if you will. But what he was trying to do is to drive home a point. And I'd say he must have done a pretty good job because they stoned him at the end of his sermon. I guess that's the marks of a good sermon, so I will fail today. (laughs) Verses 2 through 16, Stephen begins by recounting Israel's history from Abraham, refuting the accusations of blaspheming God. You know, that's the lie that was told against him and the reason he was standing before the Sanhedrin. He discusses Abraham leaving the Chaldeans for a new land promised by God, and how God removed Abraham from Haran and his father's death and brought him to the land that he was speaking of. These next verses, 17 through 43, Stephen responds to the accusations of blasphemy. Now this is where we'll be today. Moses speaking against the law by discussing Moses and the law. Now he really goes into a lot of details about Moses. I think it's 
really interesting. We'll hit just a few of the high spots. In the law, he focuses on Moses' relationship with other races and how people and their leaders were failed to recognize him or to obey his teachings. You got to understand, you know the story of Moses, a little baby, went down the river. He was raised uh, in Pharaoh's house. He was taught by the greatest teachers of the day. And it, it's remarkable to me with all the teaching that Moses had inside of Egypt's camp, so to speak, from all the renowned professors, and they were very smart, on how Moses, when God called him out and used him, he did not, a lot of that teaching was cultist type thinking. If you would have, uh, if you would have looked at uh, a doctor's, I saw Trevor maybe think, if you looked at a doctor's cabinet back then, it would be a you know, wart of snake's teeth, uh, it, it, it'd be a gopher guts, and it'd be all this kind of stuff that they used in their cultish uh, remedies uh, for things. But when Moses came on the scene, we don't find any trace of him mixing any of, the, any of this cultish type thinking in his leading of Israel. Even though he was trained and he was very smart, and, uh, but he chose to follow God. And he chose to forget or not use a lot that he was taught. Amen. So, we see that happens there. Let's move on quickly. Verses 44 through 53, Stephen responds to the accusations of speaking against the temple and saying that Jesus would destroy it. Now, this is another thing he wants us to understand because he's being accused of destroying the temple. And he says, no, there's more understanding to this temple deal. <clears throat> A lot of people, and where, where replacement theology gets it wrong, replacement theology says that the church replaced uh, the Jews, but the problem is this temple understanding was way, has been in the Old Testament. God's been speaking about it being in you, in your heart. It, that wasn't new information. But then those in replacement theology today say, this is new information here. We're now the temple. We're now, uh, well, I mean, they were taught that uh, in the Torah Old Testament. I'll give a few examples about how replacement theology gets that wrong and where they, where they make their wrong turn. Verses 54 through 60, Stephen is the first martyr and the first mention of Paul. Stephen's speech ends with an indictment of his audience who were enraged by his words. He is then stoned to death, but before he dies, he sees a vision of God's glory and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now to me that's amazing because the last words Jesus said in his trial was the next time you see me, you'll see me in my glory. That was his last words, and we see him uh, referring to it here. Okay, so that's uh, Stephen's deal there. That's kind of a little overview. Now we're going to pick up here in verse 15. It says, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died. He's telling this historical study. And he died and, uh, and our fathers and were carried away to uh, Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose, which they knew not. Uh, Joseph, so you know the story. Tipped in your contacts. Well, there you go. A smart watch. <laughs> it's smarter than I am. But so we can see here that Egypt, we know that they went to Egypt during the famine. They stayed in Egypt. Joseph fed his family. They, but Egypt then grew. We don't know exactly how many years that is, but it's a long time. And it says here that another king arose which knew not Joseph. So that was the problem. Joseph basically saved Egypt, but we had a Pharaoh change. Then he didn't really think that, didn't know that much of Joseph. So we see he was telling the story there how they got in trouble. So we see here that a significant period of time passes between Joseph and the Pharaoh of Exodus. The Pharaoh that opposed the Hebrews 
was a Syrian and not Egyptian, showing a change. It says in Isaiah, For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed uh, them without cause. So Joseph started blessing Egypt. He ended up uh, when Moses was leading them out of Egypt being, they were turned into slaves basically because their numbers grew so great. Pick up in verse 19, the same dealt subtility with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end and might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair, uh, nourished up in his father's house for three months. Y'all know the story. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for their own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty uh, in words and deeds. So you know the story. Moses hit, hit the little basket in the water. Pharaoh's daughter took him up. Here's Stephen before the Sanhedrin. You know they know the story. And so they were getting ticked off the more and more. Why are you telling us these stories? And it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in his words and deeds. Pharaoh's daughter brought him up as her own son. Moses would have been in line to be the next Pharaoh, I know, and whoever did uh, the famous movie that it has Pharaoh, had, what was the title? Of it? Was that the, the what? Ten Commandments, that's what it was, yeah, Ten Commandments. That Pharaoh had a son in the movie and all like that, but that doesn't quite hit the historical uh, discovery. Technically, it probably was Moses, at least, was the next one in line if there was a son even uh, after him. Um, so Josephus points out that he was mighty in military arts. Moses was being groomed for leadership in Egypt. Now you can say, Alan, what's that got to, to do with us today? Just follow it through, and it, it's going to blow your socks off. Now watch it. Being groomed for leadership in Egypt, uh, Philia points out that Moses was tutored by the most celebrated foreign schools in arithmetic, geometry, music, philosophy, the arts, and science. So he was in line, of course, of being the Pharaoh. Philio of Alexandria was a Hellenistic Jew, and we went over that a few weeks back, philosopher who lived in Alexandria in the Roman uh, province of, of Egypt there. So this is just a historian giving uh, another account. Verse 23, and when he was uh, a full 40 years old, now this starts the life of 40 years for Moses. <laughs> um, when he was a full 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren uh, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. There again, Stephen's given the story. He's paraphrasing a little bit because he knows they already know the story, but it gives us enough information to know what storyline he's following. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood him not. Now, most of us don't get that, but in the Old Testament, when Moses went and defended his brethren for being mistreated, and then he killed the Egyptian, that was a sign to them from God that God was going to deliver them. And so a lot of people say, well, Alan, everything doesn't mean something. The only thing I'm here to tell you, most things do mean something. And God's trying to speak to us through all of these different circumstances in our life. And it's up to us to try, to try and learn and read the languages of God. I have a couple areas in my life I'm asking God to direct me. And He keeps directing in, uh, in a way I don't want to go. And... Uh, I don't know if he's stuttering or I'm not listening. But he keeps saying the same thing. And uh, so I, I know I, what the feeling is. Well, here we see that Stephen was pointing out that, again, Israel is slow to understand God's hand and moving on Israel's behalf. Now, I don't know. Let me just share something, a little something personal here quickly. In my life, 
I'm 71 years old, and since I was in my later 20s, maybe early 30s, it seems to me that I've always had to do something two times. And I don't know why. It's just a little thing. I guess I maybe I blame it on my daddy. I inherited it from him, maybe. It seems like everything I do, I have to do twice. If a tire goes flat, I'll have to fix it again. Just well go ahead and stick a knife in it and fix it again. Because <laughs> I'll have to do it twice. It's like every, everything I do, I, I just mess it. I just have to do it, do, it, do it two times. And then I found out I'm a lot like Israel. Israel had to do everything at least two times. They just couldn't get it. So that's what you'll start seeing happening here. It says Stephen was pointing out again that Israel was slow to understand God's hand moving on Israel's behalf. And I'm like, God, don't you think that's a little tough? You mean Moses goes out there, he's in Pharaoh's house, he kills an Egyptian uh, on behalf of, 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 of a Jew, and they're supposed to figure out that you're sending him as a deliverer. I'm like, well, God, that's, that's a little much. And here's what you've got to understand. They didn't have the Holy Spirit then like we do now, but they still had the Holy Spirit. In other words, they had divine revelation then just like we can now. You see, if you rule out divine revelation, the Jews weren't getting it. Here, here comes Moses. He's a symbol. God's saying to Israel, I'm going to deliver you. And, and I mean, for, watch it. He says, I'm even going to deliver you with somebody out of Pharaoh's house. So God's speaking to them. They just aren't walking close enough with the Holy Spirit to get the revelation of what God's wanting to tell them. So here's my point. God's trying to tell all of us in here stuff, but we don't have the revelation because we're not close enough to the Holy Spirit to get it. That wasn't very nice, was it? I just heard myself play it back. But I told you the truth just the same. That's what the Word of God is saying here. We've got to have a relationship with the Holy Ghost because there's stuff happening around us all the time that God's speaking to us in. And we're just missing it. It's going over our heads and we keep praying for God to speak. What we're missing is the key of interpretation to what we're seeing. God doesn't use English unless He has to. He uses circumstances of life. He uses people. Same thing was happening. Here's our example to Israel. A huge message. God was saying, I'm sending you a deliverer. But they missed it the first time. So here, and, and you've got to understand, that was Stephen's point. If you're with me here, I need to stop that, but nonetheless... Stephen's point was, you're missing God even though he's speaking. So we're all, all the time, it is the nature of God's people to keep crying out for God to speak. And God said, I, I am speaking and I have spoken. You're just not getting it. You know, there's one thing to get it and there's another one to get it. Right? And I think sometimes we get it, but we're just not getting it. And that's what this example is here. So we want to start learning this and, and see Stephen was trying to show the Sanhedrin, you're not getting it. That's the point of all of this history. Because he, the history, he's not showing that Israel was this great victor. He's saying, here's where they failed. And he said, and you're failing at the same thing. And God's telling us, we're failing at the same thing. Now this thing of walking with God is tremendously supernatural. It's not mental. It is spiritual. We have to use our mental factors, but God will use foolish things to speak to you in. Because it'll confuse the wise. And he's not talking about somebody else when he said that. The application is the wise man that's in you. It'll look foolish to you. Oh, it might be God. Now, how many of you respond like that? 
Just consider and test what I'm saying. Stephen, uh, all right, uh, I went too quick. Acts 7, 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they uh, strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he uh, that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou did the, the Egyptian yesterday? In Stephen's story, he is saying that they made the accusation, you're going to do me wrong just like you did that Egyptian. They were making fun of Moses, to Moses, when he was their deliverer. Now, how many Moseses has God sent us in our lives and we made fun of them? And God's sending us a message. I'm, I'm telling you, church, we really got to sober up here. We're in a drunken stupor of selfism. We think we're wise, and we got to be dumbed down a little bit so we can hear God. Here we go. Stephen was showing them how Israel rejected the leader that God had sent them. Israel had to stay in Egypt 40 years longer because they did not recognize Moses as their deliverer. They rejected him, so there was another 40 years took place. What if they had accepted Moses then, that one little incident? It had saved them 40 years of slavery. So, so there's a consequences. God's not wanting us to hear him just so our life's better. God's wanting us to hear him, him because this is life is real time. This is real stuff. This is not a simulation. Life is real. And so we want to be more attentive, especially in these days, of how God is speaking to us. And he's trying to save us another 40 years. I'm 71. I don't got another 40 years. I've got to start getting it right. It says, who made the ruler and a judge over us? They were actually making fun. Stephen compares Moses and Jesus. He was showing them how they were rejecting Jesus just like they did Moses. That's what he was saying to the Sanhedrin. That's the reason he was giving them a comparison of that story. Here's proof in Matthew 21. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority does these things, and who gave thee this authority? Jesus was preaching and was teaching, and then they accused Jesus just like the Jews did Moses. And Stephen's making this comparison, but he's saying it in the face of the Sanhedrin. Can you see how, why and how their temperature was rising? John 1.11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, listen, I have received Jesus. I have accepted him as my Savior. That's my, my problem. My problem is, is, is God sending me Je Moseses all the time, and I'm not receiving them? Is God speaking to me? Is he helping me? Is he trying to direct me? My paths. But am I not receiving what God sends me? So we can understand why our only hope is to have a relationship with His Holy Spirit, and it's a still, small voice. I mean, I, I'm sure you can, as many people as in here, I am sure that you can identify with times in life that about the next week or two, in other words, a still small voice speaks to us. In the next week or two, we think, and we didn't do it, of course, and next week or two we think, I, I remember, I think that still small voice must have been the Holy Spirit, and I didn't do it. Has anybody ever done that one? Okay. And you're like, oh, that, that little quiet voice was God. I just thought it was a little suggestion or something. Or is it wrong thought? So as God's people, I'm not fussing at us. I, I'm just trying to make us aware 
of this supernatural life that we live in. A preacher can stand up and say, well, the Lord gave me a message for this week, and we all believe it. I believe it. I believe that the Lord can give the preacher a message to preach. But the Lord wants to speak to all of us the same way. It's not just the preacher. God's a big God. He's got a lot to say. He likes to carry on a lot of conversations at the same time. He loves it. I've just discovered I'm not quite in tune. It's easy to be in tune if you're going to teach a lesson. It's hard to be in, it's, it, you got to shift over in everyday life and use the same tuning fork. That's, it's, it's, it's just a skill that that's the reason God gives us teachers. That's the reason I'm here to aggravate you and just bring up the thought for you to test and, and, and to see if there could be any truth here. But the hope is that we will be more aware of this still small voice of the Holy Ghost trying to speak to us. Trying to speak to us. Try, just test that still small voice. It all of a sudden it'll come up just as this. It's just a small little thought usually. It doesn't shout too often. If, if, if God has to shout, you won't like it. <laughs> you won't like it. Now, Let's move on. They rejected Jesus. Verse 29, Then fled Moses at the saying, and was a stranger in the land of Media, where he begat two sons. So you know the story. He was another 40 years. They rejected Moses, and the story is, and then he fled, and he into the wilderness, another 40-year stint, where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, there it is, there appeared to him in the wilderness at Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So here, here, here Moses went up, killed the Egyptians. There's the message. The Jews rejected him. He then ends up and then he'll flee. He runs off for another 40 years, finds him a wife, has a couple of sons. He's out there doing a sheep deal, minding his own business, and walks up upon a burning bush. Stephen's telling this to the Sanhedrin, trying to make a point. Now, this is said to be an uh, uh, archaea bush. It's a, actually, it's a thorn bush in the desert. They're everywhere over there, and it's just, it's just a thorny-looking bush. You wonder how it even lives. It just ends up, it loses every, it ends up looking like just all thorns. But that's the bush that is believed to have been the burning bush. Now, the, one of the reasons is Thorns are a symbol of the curse, a crown of thorns. When Jesus, when they put a crown of thorns on Jesus, the reason is that was the sign of the curse. The curse was put in his head, pushed down in his head until the blood. He bled the blood of the curse. He shed his blood for the curse. That's what the crown of thorns. Well, the same thorn, the bush, was still the same burning bush, was the thorny bush. And then the fire symbolizes judgment. Now here's the good point. There again, it's all symbols, but the good point is the fire symbolizes judgment. There's a thorny bush. God appears in it, and you know the fire doesn't consume the bush, right? But it's judgment. The good news is there's fire in judgment, but you're not consumed. Can somebody say, hey, man, <laughs> there's judgment and there's fire, but you're not going to be consumed. It's a miracle. God is speaking. Can we hear God speak? You can say, well, Alan, that's the judgment of God. They get what they deserve. Well, God's not doing that yet. It's called His grace and His mercy. The bush was not consumed, which means, which is a symbol of grace. Even though there's judgment, there's grace. I don't care what anybody in here has done. We all deserve the judgment of God. We all deserve the fire of God that the Word of God speaks about. But God has issued His grace to take on your thorns and your fire. He has received your judgment and offered you His grace and His love and His mercy. 
And Stephen's making this point to the Sanhedrin. He said, you got it, but you don't get it. You got it, but you just don't get it. You got to get it, which is more than I got it. So there's the bush, burning bush. Oh, mercy, my time's getting gone. Let me read through these next verses quickly. We'll point out just a few things that are important. Uh, Verse 32, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet. The Lord said that to him. For the place where thou stands is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, he said, and I have heard their groaning and then come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and deliverer of my hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, and after that he showed wonders and signs in the lands of Egypt, and y'all know those, and the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. Stephen's telling them this story, that, that the second time, the second time, Moses went to the children of Israel. He got them delivered. He called them out. He went to the Pharaoh. You know the plagues and all of those stories that Moses performed there before the Pharaoh. So the second time, they followed him. Are you with me? Now, what would have happened if they would have followed him the first time? They could have saved 40 years. That's a lot of payments if you're buying a house. And so here, he moves on into verse 37 This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Liken unto me, him shall ye hear. Now what Stephen's building the case for here is that Jesus is that second voice. You rejected the first one. He's going to come again. And Jesus, when he has come upon this earth, is that second voice. Now, we know the rest of the story is they are now rejecting that voice. But he's going to come again, and they'll receive him. This third go around, they'll receive him. But they've got to go through their tribulation period and before they do. It's just like the 40 years in, ju- in, the, in judgment. But I'm, not, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. <clears throat> he said, this prophet shall raise up to you. Stephen is showing how Moses himself foretold the coming of Christ. It's in Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, and to him ye shall hearken. So you see, Stephen was technically quoting Deuteronomy. And he was showing them the Sanhedrin. Here it is in the Word. I'm just showing it to you and reminding you here. He goes into verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai. And with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto him, which we know, the Ten Commandments. Stephen's point is that Moses himself predicted the very person whom they are now rejecting. He's making this plea before the Sanhedrin that you've rejected Jesus as your Messiah. Stephen is holding Moses in higher regard than those that are even listening. And they take great pride in doing that. Verse 39, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them in their hearts, turn back again into Egypt. Saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. In other words, they were, <laughs> the second time around, Moses delivers them, parts the Red Sea, does all this, and then they say, well, Moses, he's run off somewhere. 
Uh, we don't know where he went. Well, he went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Listen, he got more than just, I'm going to show you here. I got five minutes. Moses came down the mountain with more than just the Ten Commandments. He got the ten, but he got a whole lot more. I'm going to show it to you if I don't run out of time. So they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices unto the idol, rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Yeah, okay, go get you some. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness. <clears throat> gave them up to worship the host of heaven. This is your uh, Trevor there again did a teaching about all the, uh, the gods, the ancient gods. It was out of astro astrology and all the signs. If you, You've heard people say don't read your, uh, what's it called, your horoscope. I started to say horticulture. Don't read your, your, your horoscope. <laughs> Meaning the stars and the planets, of course. Idol worship is in the blood of the man. Can you hear that? In the golden calf and worshiping of the planets. To worship idols is just in us, people. It's in our blood. It's in the fallen nature of man to worship something, quote, even other than God. So we really must keep ourselves in check here of what is it that we worship. Well, I'll tell you what you worship is what you think about the most. Now, let's move on quickly. We've got a few minutes here. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Remphim, figures which ye made up to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon, he said. <coughs> there he is, Moloch again, the tabernacle of Moloch. You all know all about that. We're up to our necks, you know, in the abortion and all that mess. It's, just, it's the same thing. They would actually put their babies on this burning hot statue to sacrifice them to this idol. There is a kind of a famous, if you will, pencil picture of Moloch and how they would uh, put their babies. They had a fire under this metal statue and offering uh, their babies unto them. Amos, it says this, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, Chen, and your images, the star of your God, which ye have made to yourselves. Therefore will I carry you to go into the captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, uh, whose name is the God of hosts. Stephen is again showing Israel their pattern of rejecting God. As he keeps on with this story, he's showing them a pattern. Now listen, don't think too bad on the Jews, because God picked the Jews to be a storyline that gives a, you're, we're the same. It's a group of people that had to endure all of this mess, just so God could write about it in his book to give us an example of what humans do. All right? So he's talking about you and I. Now let's move on quickly. Boy, I wanted to get you to that other thing. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Now I don't know if you know what I just read. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Here we see that God had also let Moses see the tabernacle. It was probably when he received the Ten Commandments. Because he was up on the mountain. He was getting more than just the Ten Commandments. He came down with what the tabernacle was and, and, and all of this. Now here's the, here's the cool deal. When you start seeing what happened here, we know today, fast forward, that we are the temple and the tabernacle of God. But Moses saw that too. He had to, God gave him something that would symbolize this. Listen, it gets good. It gets better in Perina dog chow. It, get, it gets gooder and gooder. Now, um, so it says, according to the fashion that, well, I wanted to, I'm going to have to stop there because of my time. According to the fashion that he had seen. Not only did he see and have the Ten Commandments, God gave him a picture, or he actually set it up in front of him beside the burning bush. Moses saw it. 
So he could then make, and God, I believe, downloaded in Moses the understanding of the symbol of the tabernacle. God was totally talking to him in symbols, burning bushes, and yada, just go on and on. So he was doing all of this. And then the Ten Commandments was also a symbol. Yes, it was Ten Commandments, but those Ten Commandments are symbolic. And he saw the tabernacle, and I'm going to leave you right there. Till next week, if you're interested, let's stand. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and for this day. Lord, I do pray that if there's anything that I've said and taught that's not correct, I pray it'd fall to the ground. And I pray that it wouldn't harm anyone. If there's anything that I've said that I view and is truth, I pray it'll be quickened to our souls and be quickened to our spirits. And I ask and pray, oh God, that this uh, as we learn that it'll help us have a greater understanding of who you are to help us follow you and to understand you and where we can hear your voice. It's our prayer, O oh God, we will be more attentive to the Holy Spirit as you speak to us through your word, through your people, through worship, through circumstances of life. I pray that we'll be a people that can hear the voice of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.